Now, the text this morning is we're studying a guy that actually did this. In fact, uh, the guy named Nehemiah, he uh, was taken from his home into a foreign country, and he could have lived any way that he wanted to live. He could have gone to the right, to the left, and not hold on, held on to God. He could have, uh, you know, not held on to his faith. But Nehemiah decided to hold on to his faith, and as a result, God called him to do something huge in the world. He called him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down by armies. So he called him to do that. And so at the point in the text that we're going to be in this morning, Nehemiah chapter 4, it is a moment where he has uh, prayed about it. He has come up with a plan to rebuild the walls. He has talked to the king about it. If you want to read a part of that story, read Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3, chapters 1 through chapter 3. And he has done all of that, and they've started the work on the wall. But what happens is, when we get to chapter 4, we see that it's not going to be as easy as maybe he once thought to rebuild this wall. So we get to chapter 4. He is a guy that's trying to be all that God wants him to be and follow God in each direction that he, he wants him to go. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, we pick up with the story. Now, I'm going to have to get there because my Bible wasn't open to that particular passage. Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Yeah, the pastor doesn't know the book of the Bible, books of the Bible. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yes, you are correct. You are. She said it was after Ezra. Right. Nehemiah chapter 4. And it says this. Now when Sembalat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. It is amazing that people would get upset with building a wall of protection around a city. I'm trying to say anything, but I am trying to say something. Okay? It is amazing that, people, that somebody would get upset at that. And the point in this particular verse right here is the per people that are getting upset at Jerusalem building a wall around their city are the enemies. The enemies are the people that would get upset with you protecting yourself. The enemies would be the people that would be upset with you trying to control things, the ins and outs of a city. I'm not saying anything political. I'm just trying to say this. Enemies get upset when you try to protect yourself. And so the first point, I guess, of this, of this particular talk this morning is this. When you decide to walk for Jesus and when you decide to do something for Jesus and you decide to do the things that you need to do, there are going to be people that are upset with you about it. There are going to be people that are upset with you taking a stand. There are going to be some people upset with you um, doing the right thing because they are doing the wrong thing. And the people that get upset with you for doing the right thing, following Jesus, following the scriptures, doing what God wants you to, are the enemies. You see, everybody that's on your side is going to be for you following Jesus. Everybody that loves Jesus is going to be with you. Everybody that, that is like, yeah, that's a real good thing is going to be right by your side. It is the critics. It is the enemies. It is the people that get upset at you following Jesus that are actually the enemies of not only you, but of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you also have friends with you. One thing that I see from this, this first verse is it's sim, symbolic. He heard that we were building and he was angry. Yeah, but I think sometimes we skip over the we were building when opposition comes in. We forget that we are not doing this alone, that we actually have people with us, that we actually have people that are supportive. This is one of the reasons that church is so important so that you and I know who is on our side. Right, church? So that you and I know that there's more people than just us. Um, each year, our, our youth goes to what's called Winter Jam. And how many of you have ever gone to Winter Jam? Greensville College, several of you. Yeah, Winter Jam. 
Winter Gym, Greensboro Coliseum, and the place is absolutely packed with people singing and praising the Lord, and there's uh, Christian music on, on the stage, and it's just absolutely incredible. I think it's great to sit there and uh, worship the Lord with all those people, but I also think it's equally as important for people to see we are not alone that there are tens of thousands of people that are believers, that are trying to walk with Jesus, that are trying to do what is right, and they're following him. You are not alone. So when the opposition comes, because opposition will come if you decide to follow Jesus, it always does. It always does. You are not alone. So what does the opposition do? Well, the opposition... When you're trying to follow Jesus, do what he wants you to do, often tries to make you feel like you are stupid. That's what the opposition does. That's their first go-to. And it hasn't changed. In our day, if people are against the church, they make us feel stupid. How in the world can we hold on to a a text that's 2,000 years old? How in the world can we do certain things that we do? Why do you do that? It's so archaic. And here in this passage of scripture, they're playing the same play from the same playbook. Look at this. And he said, in the presence of the brothers and the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Do you see that there? What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish and burned burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on the wall, he will break it down. He will break down their stone wall. Isn't that just like an enemy to make fun of you for living for Jesus? Church, isn't that right? Have you ever been made fun of for living for Jesus, for trying to do the right thing? Um, not to bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up. Because, you know, that, that made, you know, conflictive sense. Uh, in 2020, do you know each one of these graduates was in eighth grade? And then they went into ninth grade, right? Each one of these graduates that were up here. Yeah, and so 2020, 2020 in March, we had that um, thing from the government that said everything had to shut down. Everybody remembers this, right? And then we were trying to figure out how to stay open is what we were trying to figure out to do. How can we still meet? Um, We really, nobody really at the beginning of it knew what we were dealing with, but about two weeks into it, we kind of started figuring some things out, right? We started figuring out, and so the goal was to get people to come to church so that we could see each other and not be secluded. So we did a bunch of stuff, all right? All that said, during that time, I received messages on Facebook that was mocking what we were doing here at Farmington Baptist Church. And not many people know this, but it it was constant mocking, constant mocking. And I remember one lady, there was another mandate that came out, and one lady sent me a message that said, oh, so Philip, what are you going to do now? That was all the message said. She had been taunting me the entire time, and she just said, oh, what are you going to do now? And I could just hear her because I know her, you know, with, what are you going to do? Yeah, you, what are you going to do now, right? Huh? What are you going to do now, right? And so in, inside, I was absolutely infuriated, right? Because it was, it was a joke. It was a taunt. So, so what do you do when you know you're doing the right thing? Are you with me? When you know you're doing the right thing, when you know you're doing what God wants you to do, but there are these people who are really your enemies taunting you and trying to get you to get off the path. What do you do in that moment? When this text, Nehemiah gives us a couple of things. In verse 4 it says, um, here, Oh, that was hmm, hmm. puberty. Here, oh, our God, for we are despised from, oh, wait, I can't even see now. Do we have those purple glasses? All right. 
Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do you know what he's doing? He is praying that God will break bad on his enemies. Did you know that it's okay for you to tell God to take care of your enemies? That it is okay for you to say, hey, Lord, I'm, I'm trying my best to do what you want me to do. Can you just take care of these people? And that's an appropriate prayer, and I'll tell you why. Because when you are being attacked, they aren't attacking you. They're attacking God, and they don't realize it. In fact, when they're attacking you for living the way that you're supposed to live, for doing the things that God has called you to do, they aren't attacking you. They're attacking God, and they are going to have to wrestle with him. You see, we pray this way, and this is what what it does for us. It frees us from engaging in things we shouldn't engage in and being distracted from our enemies. It enables us to say, hey, Lord, will you just take care of them because you've given me a job to do, and that is what I want to focus on. I do not want to be distracted by enemies that are against me in doing God's work. And you should not want to be distracted when it comes to you doing God's work in your life as well. You pray that God will take care of your enemies and you get focused back on the job that you're supposed to do, living for Jesus and doing what he wants you to do. So he prays a very bold prayer. And he doesn't stop there. In verse 5, it says, Do not cover their guilt, and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked who? You. To anger in the presence of the builders. And so what did he do? He prayed it, and then the very next (laughs) verse says, So we built the wall. Right? Right? I mean, they're coming against us, but we're going to build the wall. In 2020, we're going to have church, and we're going to figure out how to do it, right? And so here it is, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And so he he got focused back on, on the wall. He got focused back on what he was supposed to do, and the wall began to get built again. Now, you would think, you would think that it would be, Um, over, right? You would think that it would be over. Like the enemies would see the walls being built and none of their taunts would account to anything. But if you have an enemy, enemies do not let up when you're doing something for God. They do not let up. They will find another way to taunt you. They will find another way to get what they want. And so if they can't shame you into stopping for Jesus, what they do is they try to get you to fear doing what you're doing for Jesus. And that's precisely what happens here. In verse 7, it says this, But when Symbolet and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdites heard the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. Why? Because enemies of what you're doing for God are always angry at you. They're always angry at you. There's nothing you can do about that. You can't make them happy. Verse 8, and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. So they're going to fight. They want, they're planning to do this. And they're making sure the rumor mill is happening so that Nehemiah and his workers know that there's an army being formed to battle against them, physically battle. In verse 9, it says, this is what we do. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. And in Judah, it was, yeah, against them day and night. So what does he do? He hears that they are uh, going to attack and so Nehemiah doesn't say, all right, guys, we've got to stop building the wall and we've got to grab our, our armor and we've got to get ready for battle. In fact, Nehemiah doesn't even say, all right, guys, come here. This is what we're going to do. I know where the enemy camp is. I know where they're keeping these people. 
and we are going to stop building the wall long enough to go to war to take care of the enemies, and then we're going to come back and build, and build the wall. Nehemiah doesn't do that. Because Nehemiah's purpose was not to battle the enemy um, offensively. Nehemiah's job was to continue to build the wall, live for God, be who he was supposed to be, right? That was his job. And so he has to figure out how to complete that job while having a threat. And this is what he did. It's brilliant if you read the rest of the passage. He tells each one of the workers to go home and get their sword. There wasn't an NRA back then. There was a SRA or SSA, because that would be rifle, right? It would be NSA, National Sword Association. Right? The other one was an NBA, National Bow Association. It also had bows and arrows. So he told them to go home, and he told them to get their weapons. And he said, strap that weapon on the side, and here's what we're going to do. Half of you are going to guard the people that are working on the wall. And the people that are working on the wall, you're going to strap that sword to your side and be ready just in case somebody attacks. And um, if you're carrying stuff to the wall, like the mortar and the bricks or whatever we're using, I want you to carry in one hand. I want you to have that sword ready in the other hand, because when they attack, we're going to be ready, and we're going to take care of business. You see, when you're doing something for God, you never have to be offensive. But you do have to have a good defense ready to go. It's not offensive that we're a part of. It's defensive. You see, our offensive leader is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to take care of that part of it. When we're doing something for Jesus... We make sure that we're protected while we are doing it, and we strap our swords to our side, and we get the job done. In other words, words, you don't ignore the people that want to attack you. You don't ignore the people that want to come against you as an army. But what you do is you back up a minute, and you say, I'm going to continue to do the work, and I'm going to put these things in place so that we are protected, so that we can finish what God wants us to do. You see, I have found in life that attacks only work if you don't change your strategy. Attacks only work if you don't change your strategy. You see, when you're you're doing something for Jesus, when you're living for Jesus and you're, you're full on and someone attacks you, someone comes at you or they threaten you, the thing to do, most people, well, here's a couple of things that happen. Sometimes when people attack you, Christians just kind of back up and wave the white flag. That's what they do. They wave this white flag, right? And we're going to get to that in a moment. But when people attack you and you want to continue to, to walk for Jesus, you have to change your strategy, Or if there's something going on wrong, you have to change what you're doing in order to accomplish what God has for your life. Attacks only work if you don't change your strategy. Um, So let's just just give the Bible as an example of this. Nehemiah wants to build the wall. There's no swords. There's no nothing. He wants to build this wall. He wants to get it done. There's an attack made. There's a threat on people's lives. And so he says, hey, we can't quit building the wall, but here's how we can adjust building the wall. Our strategy in building the wall is going to change. So, hey, everybody's going to have a sword. Everybody's going to have a bow, and we're going to be ready. In fact, Nehemiah goes one step further to say, if your side of the wall gets attacked, blow a trumpet, and we'll be right there to help you. We're the backup team. So he changed the strategy. And it's irritating, ladies and gentlemen, to change the strategy when you're doing something for God. It's irritating to change the strategy. Right? It's irritating to change the strategy. So maybe, you know, I'm kind of trying to read the audience. Maybe you're wondering how this changing of the strategy applies to you in your life. Maybe that's what you're wondering in this moment. Well, let me give you, give you an example, uh, example of something. 
There are some times that things happen in a family that, um, that is devastating. I don't know, man. Mm. I don't like that example. Has anybody ever had a family member go off the, go off the path way? Anybody ever had that before? Yeah. Go off the pathway, and then the family has to adjust to it. And sometimes family adjusts to it in the wrong way. Like they begin to follow the person that's doing what's wrong and begin to get involved in whatever the person is doing wrong. And before too long, the whole family has been drawn away from God because they followed this one individual that is away from God. And one of the reasons that they went in that direction is because once that family member went over here and they started doing some things, the family member started maybe making fun of the family or making them feel bad because they, were, they said that you are judgmental of me and my lifestyle. Is everybody tracking? So, so what do you do in that moment? Where, where you have this family member that's over here and you're trying to live for Jesus and keep your family living for Jesus and focused on Jesus and they're attacking you with, with like, you don't really love us, you don't really, well, um, depends on what it is. Sometimes you have to block them. And you have to say, hey, I can't let you back in my life until you straighten out your life. And you change your strategy at Christmas time. You change your strategy from maybe, I don't know, having them come over to you go see them somewhere and give them the gift that you want to give them at Christmas, and that's all that you do. Is, is everybody tracking? But, but you change your strategy. If you don't change your strategy, you're going to go into defeat. The, the people in 2020 that kept sending me messages, do you know what, what I did? I blocked them for 30 days. Then 30 days after that, if they continued, I blocked them again for 30 days. And then there's three strikes and you're out because I'm not Jesus. <laughs> if it came the next 30 days, it was just done. I just don't want to see anything from those people. I love them, but that's not what I want to see. I changed my strategy because if you don't, the voices get inside your head and then you can't be as strong for Jesus. If you listen to the individual that's going outside of your family and you don't adjust your strategy to handle that particular, particular situation, you don't adjust that strategy to where you stay faithful to Jesus. Is everybody tracking with me now? You will wind up being defeated by the person that has decided to become your enemy and get you off track. It is okay to say, we can't have Christmas with you because you get flat out drunk when we're there and I can't have that around my kids. It is okay to say that and do something different. It is, it is okay to make a strategy and to say, look, I love you, we love you, your family, we're gonna be with you. Like if something happens to you, we are going to be there, but we just can't hang around you while you are living like that. It is okay if you don't adjust your strategy are we tracking? You'll wind up being in defeat, and attacks only work if you don't change your strategy. You see, people settle instead of changing their strategy. People settle because they don't consider the possibility that they can make a change, and they settle for something less than what they could really what they could really be. So, so that's it. Um, sometimes when people would say, get attacked, they don't change their strategy. They just surrender. They just surrender. And they say these words, it is what it is. That is a surrender, I'm done, I'm not battling statement. It is... It is what it is. There is nothing I can do about it. It is what it is. Now, graduates, you have a book. 
in your uh, little gift that we gave you this year. One is the best book of all. That's the Bible. The second one that is in there is called... Um, doggone it. Yeah, it is what you make it. Man, I cannot believe that. It is what you make it. Lord, I need help this morning with my memory. Ugh. Yeah, it is what you make it is the book title. It is what you make it. You see, things are going to happen to you in life. And in that sense, yeah, you can't do nothing about it. But those things that happen to, your, to you in life, it is what you make it. When they come your way and it's bad, what you make of that moment is what matters. What you make of that moment uh, directs you in the way that you should go. What you make of it will determine whether or not you are a victor in the end or defeated in the end. If you say it is what it is, you have just defeated yourself. But if you say it is what I make it, that is the way you think in order to go toward victory. Is everybody with me on this? And Nehemiah, there's that thing again. And Nehemiah didn't sit there and say, oh my goodness, they're making fun of us. Well, it is what it is. I guess we need to stop, raise the white flag, and be done. He didn't do that. When he heard that they were developing an army to attack them, he didn't say, oh, it is what it is. Might as well not do anything. He didn't do that. He looked at it and said, this is going to be what we made it. I've been called of God to build this wall, and we're not going to stop. We're going to make this something good. And at the very end of this story, he completes the walls, he put up, puts the gates up, and he goes on to victory. It is what you make it is a victorious strategy. It is a strategy to victory. Never say, never say, it is what it is. And I stole that from that book. I put my own spin on it. But I stole that from that book. So here's a couple of things. First, Nehemiah had a couple of challenges. He had to build a wall. He had to talk to a king. Um, he had to observe the wall once he got to Jerusalem, figure out what he was going to do. He had to handle enemies. He had to continue to build under pressure. And in all of that, he stayed faithful to God. He remained a man of character. And he remained on target for what God wanted him to do. And so for everybody in this room, graduates, moms and dads, people that aren't graduates, that are still in school, people that are older, we need to remain faithful to God and do what he's called us to do even when we're being attacked, even when people are trying to get us to leave the faith, even when they're trying to get us to leave the faith. It is what you make it. And from my perspective and from the Bible's perspective, it is what you make it because he is making it through you. So at the end of this message this morning, um, I just feel compelled just to give the gospel. And... The way I want to do it is, is through my own personal testimony, what changed my life. When I was eight years old, I, um, I was very energetic in church, very energetic in church. Um, in fact, I, I was a good kid, but a mischievous kid. Does that make sense? It wasn't that I was doing anything wrong, but I was doing stuff wrong. For instance, my dad led the singing, my mom played the piano, and uh, I would want to go visit people during the, during the worship service. So what I would do is I would get up and walk to the pew that they were at and just talk to them a little bit and then go over here and go over here. All the while, my dad was in the choir, my mom was, was playing the piano, and well, my dad took care of that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> right? Out the door, spanking, come back in. 
and he told me not to walk to other places. Well, the thing my dad didn't consider was that I was very creative. So what I did was I started to go up underneath the pews to get to people. Because you can't stop me. You can't. I'll find another way. So I went up underneath the pews and, and went, popped up here, popped up there. And it took about two Sundays for my dad to figure this thing out, how I was getting places. He, he couldn't figure it out. So then I couldn't go up underneath the pews. So dad resigned. This is sad. Dad resigned leading the worship, and he sat with me in service to teach me how to sit through a service. That's what my dad did. It's sad because I feel bad about it now that he had to do that, had to stop. Well, anyway, he did the right thing. So we were having a revival service on a Wednesday evening, and my dad had gotten sick during the day. And during that revival, I had wanted, like on Monday night and on Tuesday night, I had wanted to go forward and accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I wanted to do that because I knew that I was a sinner and I knew that there was punishment for that sin and I knew that Jesus Christ took the punishment on the cross for my sin and that was very compelling to me. And so Monday night, my dad was sitting with me and I didn't move, I didn't go forward, I was just scared to do it. On Tuesday, I, the same thing. I was just scared to go forward because I thought that dad would grab me is what I thought he would do as I was going down the aisle. And to be honest, he should have grabbed me because he didn't know what I was going to do. So on Wednesday, he was sick, couldn't go to church. So my mom took me to that revival service and I sat beside my mom through the whole message and my mom went out the pew this way and down the aisle this way. And I waited for her to get to the piano to start playing before I ran down the center aisle and grabbed the preacher and said, quick, I got to get saved. <laughs> but what compelled me to do that was this. I knew I was a sinner and I knew what punishment was because my dad gave me punishments for my my sin. And the punishment that was described in eternity of being in a lake of fire was just something I didn't want to, I didn't want to do. I didn't want to pay for my sin. I knew the only way that I could get out of that punishment, and it was that simple as a kid. I wanted to get out of that punishment was to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior because he took my punishment on the cross. You may sit here today and say, well, wasn't that fear? Yes, and you should fear paying for your own sins as well. I mean, it's a real deal. I'm not trying to convince you to receive Jesus out of fear. I'm trying to say it's a real deal. And if you leave this world without Jesus, you get thrown into a lake of fire for eternity, for eternity. But Jesus offers you forgiveness for the sins that you've committed. He took your punishment on the cross. He shed his blood for you. He arose the third day to give you life. And he opened a way for you to spend eternity in 72 degrees in heaven and sunshine. Rather than the opposite of that. And I don't know why you wouldn't choose Jesus. I just don't know why you wouldn't choose Jesus. So if you're sitting here today and you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I encourage you to do that today. It is the best decision that you will ever make in your life. Let's pray.